Good morning and welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, then welcome. My name is Brittany and I'm a nurse practitioner. Much of what I do here on my YouTube channel is educational content. And this video is a little bit unique to what I would typically do, but I do believe that it's a very important discussion to have, especially for anyone that's working in healthcare. And I think the majority of my audience is, or are, or want to be uh, working in healthcare. And so I think it's just a really important discussion. And so if you don't know what I'm referring to, or if you didn't read the title of the video, I'm going to be talking about the tragedy that recently happened with Lindsay Clancy. She was a labor and delivery nurse in Massachusetts. And on the evening of January 24th, she strangled her children and then attempted to take her own life as well. And this story, it's Honestly, it's heartbreaking. It's heavy on my mind. Uh, I've seen a lot of posts that it's heavy on their mind too. I think because we can see a little bit of ourselves in Lindsay. You know, she's young. She's a nurse. She seemingly loves her children, devoted her life to her children. According to her husband, she loved and devoted her life to her children. Um, but she struggled with postpartum depression and from now what we are seeing here, it appears postpartum psychosis. It's just scary, I think, because so many of us have experienced components of, you know, postpartum depression, and we've seen the toll it can really take on a woman's mental health. It's a lot to bring babies into this world. It puts a lot of strain physically, mentally, emotionally, and though we might not relate to her in this extreme circumstance this is worst absolute worst case scenario possible um but it's a really important discussion to have the way that i'm going to do this video is i'm going to talk about the case or the details that we know thus far and then i'm going to talk about some educational components regarding postpartum depression uh postpartum psychosis and so what that means and what as healthcare professionals that we need to be doing in our practice to help prevent these types of tragedies from occurring. So like I said, the first part of this video, it's going to be, it can be triggering, it can be very upsetting. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that's not available on public platforms already anyway, but if this is something that you don't wanna hear, then just go ahead and skip to the time that I'm gonna put up here on this video, and that will be just the educational components and I won't be talking about the story. So Lindsay Clancy, like I said, was a labor and delivery nurse. However, she was currently on leave from her position at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Her three children were five-year-old Cora, three-year-old Dawson, and eight-month-old Kaylin. Based on some Facebook posts Lindsay had made and statements that have been released, it's believed that Lindsay was on leave from her position at work due to battling with postpartum depression. She was reportedly in an intensive five-day-a-week program for her postpartum depression, and her husband, Patrick, was actually working at home from this time to be more available to be of support for Lindsay. I took a brief look at her Facebook account, and if you look, all it is is pictures of her children, of her loving and adoring her children, and from the outside looking in, you know, it looks like this is a mother that really has devoted her entire life to raising her children, loving her children, and helping other women bring babies into this world as well. Also, according to her husband, she was a very loving and devoted mother, and so it's just earth-shattering because you see these and you question, you can't help but question how and why. How did this happen? Why did this happen? So it's been reported that on January 24th, around 6.15 p.m., Lindsay's husband, Patrick, had left the home for approximately 25 minutes to go pick up carry out for the family. And during that short time while he was gone from the home, his life would be forever tragically changed. Within that short 25 minutes that Patrick was away from the home, it's reported that Lindsay Clancy, loving mother, labor and delivery nurse, strangled her three children and then jumped from her home's second story window in an attempt to take her own life. When Patrick returned home from picking up his dinner for the family, he first found his wife lying outside who had been injured from jumping. And when he went inside, he would then find all three of his children unconscious. He was the person that did call 911. Uh, two of them, Cora and Dawson, the two older ones, were pronounced that day. And then Callan was airlifted to a hospital in Boston where he 
also tragically passed just days later. And so now Lindsay currently is still, from the last I read, in the hospital. They haven't said anything about her condition as far as health condition. She is under police cu custody. And when she is physically fit, she will be tried in court. There is a GoFundMe for Patrick Clancy, and I will link it in the description to this video. There was a post made two days ago by Patrick himself, and it's had me crying for sure. I cannot read that on this video. I do want to, however, read an excerpt from it though, and what he had to say about his wife, Lindsay Clancy. I want to share some thoughts about Lindsay. She's recently been portrayed largely by people who have never met her and never knew who the real Lindsay was. Our marriage was wonderful and diametrically grew stronger as her condition rapidly worsened. I took as much pride in being her husband as I did in being a father and felt persistently lucky to have her in my life. And then he goes on to say, I want to ask all of you that you find it deep within yourselves to forgive Lindsay as I have. The real Lindsay was generously loving and caring towards everyone, me, our kids, family, friends, and her patients. The very fibers of her soul are loving, and all I wish for her now is that she can somehow find peace. So yeah, I just, this story just has me shaken. It's just this awful reminder that we definitely did not need showing us mental health and the depths of hell that it can take you to. All we can hope is that somehow, some way that family will find peace, I don't know. So let's talk about now postpartum depression and what is postpartum psychosis? Is that a diagnosis? And some things that we can be doing as healthcare providers to hopefully help prevent tragedies like this from occurring. So let's talk about postpartum depression. This is what Lindsay was reportedly being treated for, uh, but there's also now a topic of postpartum psychosis. So to clarify, postpartum depression is defined as occurring within the first 12 months after delivery. However, this is interesting as the postpartum period is defined as beginning at the birth of the newborn and then lasting generally up to six to eight weeks. This is compared to American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which does lengthen that postpartum care to extend up to 12 weeks after birth. But it's really kind of convoluted when you try to look up the definition of postpartum. And there's really not a straightforward answer. It's kind of horrible if you think about it. We don't give mothers the time or the support that they need just based on that timeline alone. So postpartum depression occurs in about 10 to 15% of women across multiple different countries. And it's even higher in some middle or lower income countries. So symptoms associated with postpartum depression appear to be very similar to the features with major depressive episodes completely unrelated to pregnancy. And so you can see here how the DSM defines a major depressive episode. The DSM defines a major depressive episode as five or more of the following symptoms for at least two consecutive weeks, and at least one of the symptoms has to be either depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure. So defining symptoms include depressed mood most of the day, loss of pleasure in activities, insomnia, psychomotor retardation, fatigue, decreased ability to concentrate, feelings of worthlessness, sleep disturbances, 5% or more weight change in less than one month or a decrease in appetite, and finally, recurrent thoughts of death and or suicide. So these are the symptoms that define a major depressive episode. One should be on high alert for postpartum depression if a postpartum mother is experiencing anxiety about the infant's health and well-being, anxiety regarding their ability to care for this new infant, if the mother appears negative about the infant, if the mother appears despondent or has lack of interest in the infant, also if the mother is using alcohol or drugs, if they're unresponsive to support, if they are non-adherent to their postpartum care, or on the other side, if they're making, if they're making frequent non-routine visits to either the obstetrician or the pediatrician, 
All of these are going to be red flags for postpartum depression and should alert caregivers, spouses, healthcare professionals that this might be what's going on with this new mother. So symptoms of postpartum depression last for at least one year in up to 50% of patients. It's associated with poor nutrition and health for both the mother and the infant. It can interfere with breastfeeding, bonding between the mother and the child, and it's been associated with abnormal development and cognitive impairments in the offspring. Additionally, suicidal ideation occurs in about 3% of the population with postpartum depression. And there are women that also report thoughts of harming the infant as well. And many do describe these thoughts as intrusive, like they have no control over them and they do not want to act on them. But still, these thoughts do occur. I read something though in Up To Date when I was researching uh, postpartum depression that really kind of stuck with me and I'm going to share it with you here. So Dr. Jennifer Payne, I was reading her article regarding postpartum depression and how to manage these patients. And a quote that I read there was, thoughts of harming the baby are generally not revealed unless questioned directly. I mean, this tells you one thing, we need to be asking mothers. We need to be asking them if they're having these thoughts. Infanticide is reported in approximately two to seven births per 100,000 infants, and it is more likely to occur with something reported as postpartum psychosis. So postpartum psychosis, this occurs less frequently than postpartum depression, and it's estimated to occur in one to two births out of every 1,000. It's more likely to develop in patients that either have a history of bipolar disorder or postpartum psychosis, or if they have a family history of either. So another interesting fact regarding this is postpartum psychosis is reported to most commonly occur within the first two weeks after giving birth. And the thing that sticks out to me is that vast majority of the time, a woman's follow-up visit isn't until six weeks post-delivery. And usually that kind of ends their postpartum care anyways, that six-week checkup. I don't know. I never had anything further than that. But yeah, that per that first postpartum visit doesn't occur until six weeks. And postpartum psychosis is reported to most often occur within those first two weeks after giving birth. Of course, that wasn't the story with uh, Lindsay Clancy, um, but in the research, the research shows generally this occurs within the first two weeks. So you're hoping there is a support or someone to be alerted to these behavior changes, but what about mothers that don't have support systems or people there to help them? Those first two weeks are critical. As healthcare professionals, I think it's really important that we have a closer follow-up on these moms. I don't know. This has just been upsetting to me a little bit to read more about, and I just, I'm interested to hear what you guys think. So postpartum psychosis, this is often associated with hallucinations, delusions, overall just very bizarre behavior. Other symptoms could include manic or depressed mood, severe insomnia, rapid mood changes, anxiety, and irritability. So as far as screening goes for these patients, what tools do we have available to us to screen these women? So I don't find anything specific to postpartum psychosis, and that's because it's not truly a diagnosis, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. It's actually defined as a subset to another mental health disorder. So for example, major depressive disorder with psychotic features with peripartum onset or something like bipolar disorder, current episode manic with psychotic features with peripartum onset. We do have some tools for postpartum depression. So the most widely used screening tool for postpartum depression is the self-report 10 item Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. And so we can take a look at it here and ask questions like, in the past seven days, I have been able to laugh, see the funny side of things, look forward with enjoyment. I have blamed myself or not blamed myself. I've been anxious, I felt scared. So it's asking all of these questions and it's asking the mom to rate. Yes, most of the time, some of the time, not very often, no, never. So if they score 11 or higher, then this has a high sensitivity and specificity for postpartum depression. If they score between a five and a nine without suicidal ideation, then it's documented they should be reevaluated within one month. Of course, if a mother is experiencing suicidal ideation, then they require much 
higher level of care. And then of course, we're all familiar with the PHQ-9. We use this in diagnosing major depressive episodes and depression in patients that are non-pregnant. This can also be used, but this is obviously not specific to postnatal depression. You can look it over. I think an interesting point to both of these are that neither one talks about homicidal or intentions or thoughts of harming the baby. And if we think back to what Dr. Jennifer Payne said in that article from Up to Date, thoughts of harming a baby are not going to come up unless directly asked. And so neither one of these screening tools asks ask these questions. That seems like something that should be added on to me. I think that we need to be asking these questions. And though practitioners might be asking these questions regardless of what's on these questionnaires, I realize that. Not always. And if you have it at least on this sheet, then it's someone's asking it directly. Every postnatal woman is screened for postpartum depression. But I just don't know if we're asking these other really difficult questions. And I think all mothers, probably Lindsay too, would want to be asked that question because the overarching theme, of course, is that we're just trying to protect the children and the infants. A lot of women can relate to postpartum depression. Like I said, though, not to this extreme. Uh, and the question is, was it postpartum depression or was she having postpartum psychosis? And I'm not going to go into this story now, but I, I've taken care of actually one patient in the ER when I was a nurse that had um, postpartum psychosis. And it required a lot of observation, a lot of hands-on care. And I can't imagine if she was going through, you know, postpartum psychosis, you know, should she have been at home with her children? Should she, should she have been admitted? Was this completely unexpected? I mean, obviously, none of these questions are going to bring these babies back. And there's nothing that we can do to reverse this tragedy that's happened. But we can try and move forward and see what things that we can do, again, especially as healthcare professionals, to help prevent these things from happening. Maybe there is nothing. Maybe everything that they were doing was right. I mean, she was in therapy. Her husband was staying home. Maybe they were doing everything right. Maybe she needed a higher level of care, though. Maybe Maybe it wasn't appropriate that she was at home. I'm not sure. Maybe more details will come out. I hope they do. But going forward, like I said, I think it's important to have this discussion because we need to figure out things that we can do to protect our most vulnerable population, you know, being the, the children. So whether you are a spouse or a partner, a friend, a family member, a healthcare professional, and you are working with these patients or you are you know these people personally, you know these mothers personally, be kind, offer help, see what you can do, ask questions. And if you're a healthcare professional, ask uncomfortable questions because no one else might be asking. And like the studies have shown, the information is not going to come out unless directly asked. So do your part and ask these mothers and do not judge them, but get them help when they need it. I think that's going to be it for today's video. Like I said, this story has been waiting so heavily on me that it's keeping me up and I really wanted to get on here and talk about it with you guys and I thought it was also a really great opportunity to share some education and learn myself. I found myself learning a lot. So let me know what you guys think. Share any experiences or thoughts. I love to read it in the comments below. Until next time, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, bye.